Good morning, good afternoon everybody. This is uh, Rina Teuber from the IEC Central Office in Geneva. I am pleased to welcome you to our webinar on the role of national committees and stakeholder involvement. Today we will hear from two speakers, Catherine Fraga, who is IEC Head of Governance and Global Strategy, and Thomas Korsel, Secretary of the Swedish National Committee. Catherine will talk about the responsibilities of national committees, as well as the basic structure and role of an NC, and Thomas will share some best practices and experiences regarding how the Swedish NC is structured and their approaches to engaging stakeholders. The two presentations will last about 30 minutes. During the presentations, participants will be on listen mode only. You will have the opportunity to ask questions during the Q&A session. So, Catherine, I now hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Rina, and welcome to you all today. Um, as Rina just said in my presentation, I'm going to focus on the responsibilities of a national committee as well as the basic structure and the benefits of stakeholder engagement. I don't have much time. I, I'm going to leave uh, a little more time to Thomas. Um, so I'll take a high-level approach, but if you wish to contact me after this webinar, I'm available to discuss uh, individually with you about your specific national situation. So please don't hesitate. So, um, what's a national committee? Well, first of all, to become a member of the IEC, the first thing a country has to do is establish a national committee. Um, and I'm going to describe a little bit more a national committee in my next slides, but first I'd like to have a look at the activities that a national committee undertakes, as well as the benefits that a country gets um, from being a member of the IEC. So first of all, a national committee of the IEC is the IEC in its country. All national committees and um, becoming members agree to abide by our statutes and rules of procedure, which is the supreme governing document of the IEC. And it's the document that outlines the responsibilities of the members and of the management boards. One of the main benefits the country has from becoming a member of IEC is the possibility to participate in IEC work. And it does that by spreading the word about IEC in its country, selecting technical committees and conformity assessment activities in which it's interested to participate. It does it by voting and by sending experts to participate in IEC work. And all of that allows the National Committee to contribute to and influence IEC work so that the publications and the conformity assessment services IEC is offering meets the needs of the country's stakeholders. So NCs have a very important job in coordinating the national position among all the relevant interests for the standards and conformity assessment and management or governance work of the IEC. They, uh, the national committees, decide which experts to appoint, to what activity, and they identify new opportunities so they can make proposals for IEC to start new work in new areas. Uh, full members are also responsible for deciding who to nominate and who to elect for IEC management positions in the governance structures. So to have leaders, those leaders and those experts available to participate, national committees also must spend time promoting IEC work to be sure that the right experts are brought on board. And NCs also have the opportunity as members to implement IEC international standards as their national standards and that avoids duplication of effort and ultimately saves uh, time and money for the country and for the experts participating in the work. So when national adoptions are identical to the original IEC standard, it also helps avoid market fragmentation, obviously. Um, the IEC business model and that of many of the IEC national committees depends on revenue from the sale of standards and NCs are therefore also, also responsible for preventing unauthorized reproduction and distribution of IEC publications in their country. I've outlined that very quickly, but these are really not small tasks, and each NC has its own approach to how to deal with those, and obviously uh, later we're fortunate to hear from the Swedish NC in a minute about their approach. 
So now moving to what an NC looks like, as I've just mentioned, an NC takes the management and the technical decisions for its country for all IEC activities. And to do that effectively, national committees have to op have open access to all relevant interests in the country. You see, having public and private sector representation at the management and the technical decision-making level brings great benefits. That's uh, the experience we have, uh, we've had in the IEC. Uh, for example, if you have decisions regarding investments um, to decide which activities to participate in, you can take into account the relevant industry and policy maker needs, uh, just to give examples, leading to greater participation and in, in IEC work and, and greater use of IEC work in the long run. So it's a win-win situation. But with all that said, um, I really have to strongly stress that no one NC is the same as another. Each country has its own industrial, economic, political uh, environment and it's free to set up its national committee as it feels is appropriate for its country, as long as it represents all the relevant parties in the, interest, in the, in the country. So some national committees mirror very closely the IEC structure and they have an equivalent of the IEC Council Board, the SMB and the CAB, as well as mirror technical committees, where others have uh, just one body that takes all of the governance, the council, the SMB and the CAB, for example, in one body. Um, so far, um, we're not aware of many national committees having mirror MSB, that's market strategy boards. So we've got a whole range of national committees due to this openness and flexibility that we provide. And uh, we have some independent entities while others are hosted within minist governmental ministries or national standards bodies, for example. So who's involved in a national committee? Well, first of all, all national committees are required to have a president and a secretary. They are known as the NC officers. Generally, the NC president tends to have a kind of outward facing role and they're usually active in reaching out to new stakeholders and in, to, in helping identify new work, areas of work. And in some countries, they're also the chairs of the relevant management um, groups at the national level. Uh, the NC secretary is considered to be the chief executive of the national committee and they're responsible for ensuring coordination of the national position on management and technical issues, as well as all the other aspects I mentioned earlier that a national committee um, can, can do to benefit from being a member of the IEC. We've noticed a correlation between those NCs that have at least one of the two NC officer positions coming from industry um, and the level of participation of, in IEC work. So those NCs that have an NC officer from industry tend to be more active in IEC work. That's why we're, we strongly recommend to all national committees that they appoint um, a president or a secretary coming from industry if they can. And by industry, I'm really using it throughout this presentation in the broad sense, so talking about utility, R&D institutes, consultation groups, uh, manufacturers, associations, installers, service providers, test laboratories, etc. The, the list goes on. So moving down in the slide, the members of the National Committee are like the local stakeholders and ideally each stakeholder group should have representation at the decision-making levels of the National Committee. So they all get a say in, in the decisions that are taken. And um, these are some examples of typical interested parties. Um, that you tend to find in a national committee. As I mentioned right from the start, that really varies from country to country. Um, but this is a, a kind of list of, of typical ones that we find. By having representation of these parties at the national level, what it means is that we can be sure that the users are really at the forefront of IC work. And it makes sure that then, as that gets fed through from the national to the international level, the IEC as a whole remains market relevant. So this aspect of having a national committee that en encompasses all of the interests of the country in its work is really a key aspect of IEC culture. 
Well, on paper or um, in this presentation, uh, you know, it, I've made it sound like a very simple task, all of these different things that the National Committee has to do to, to bring these parties together to form the National Committee that takes decisions. Um, but we really know that that's not always the case, and in some countries this is actually the largest challenge that an NC faces. Um, in 2015, we launched um, an NC reporting process where we ask NCs to fill out a two-page form uh, to provide some general information to us on their current challenges, opportunities, the structure and the representation, and a summary of the outcomes uh, so far, a kind of generic summary has been shared with the community in Council Document 1958. And one of the issues raised uh, during that, in that kind of survey, um, we see and one of the main issues that NCs face is uh, stakeholder engagement. And this graph here shows the main difficulty expressed by NCs to achieve uh, kind of balanced stakeholder representation for their country. So you can see that around 30% of those that replied had the had, feel there's no difficulty, but that obviously leaves the remaining. Uh, countries uh, facing a challenge in this area. In that same report, um, several NCs, uh, at the NCs that replied, listed the number of different mechanisms used to address those gaps in stakeholder representation. You can see them here. Uh, we didn't ask them to measure the effectiveness of those gaps, but it gives you an idea of the types of activities. And um, just a few more ideas. Uh, in Frankfurt, at the general meeting in last year, we held a council discussion session breakout on this very topic. And this slide shows the examples of stakeholder engagement activities that those the participants at that discussion session recommended. However, uh, in that discussion session breakout, it was really underlined that the right approach for stakeholder engagement really varies from country to country. And one of the um, core recommendations was the, that the National Committee should establish a strategic plan for stakeholder engagement and uh, the, the role, the core crucial role of the National Committee Secretary was really stressed as well. So at, at IEC uh, central office level we also are there to support you in your activities as a National Committee. We have a resource area for National Committees on our website which explains how to maximize your benefits from IEC membership and covers all the different areas uh, with, with tips and the tool, IT tools that are available to you and you've got the link on this slide. We also offer a range of support to our national committees to help um, um, in all the other activities including supporting stakeholder engagement and that support like training for example is targeted to the specific country's needs. So, if you'd like uh, a specific dedicated support for your country, then please co either contact your regional center or me at central office or RENA, and we will uh, start looking at your specific needs and see uh, what we can do to support you in the future. And that concludes my introductory uh, presentation, so maybe I hand back to you, RENA. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Catherine. So if you have any questions for Catherine, we will uh, take them after Thomas' uh, presentation. So Thomas, uh, over to you now. Thank you very much to invite me to uh, have this uh, presentation. And I pick up uh, the last wording from Catherine that uh, one size does not fit all. The presentation I will make is based on the Swedish National Committee structure. And I don't say that is the best, uh, it's absolutely not the optimal, but uh, we have been working in IEC for 110 years, one zero, and um, we have tried to uh, slim and fit uh, our structure into a structure that uh, fits the stakeholder in Sweden. So, take the first uh, slide, Catherine. Uh, I mean the second, sorry. Go on. Yeah, uh, even though we have a long history in ISC, we see that uh, the purpose, the mission, the vision is a really strategic, strategic tool to present our, from, uh, for our stakeholders, our business and our organization. So I don't think it uh, matters if you're a long time member of IEC or if you're an affiliate or associated country, 
you should always work with a mission and vision. It's a really good tool to present the for the stakeholder, the organization and what you are doing. Because every country, every national committee has to fit in the national structure and give the benefits to its stakeholders. So ESECO have a very, ankle, a very simple purpose. It's a private, independent, non-profit organization. The participation is voluntary from all Swedish stakeholders to influence and work with the technical rules in the field of electrical engineering, nationally and internationally. It's quite easy. Everyone more or less understands it. And it put us on the map of the Swedish country that we have a work to do. So this is the purpose. The next slide, Catherine, shows our mission, which says that SEK is responsible for all standard activities in the electric technical field in Sweden, and we also coordinate the work for the international and European standardization, because we are the National Committee of IEC and CENELEC. And this mission is also quite easy to understand for, for people that we are collecting or, or gathering uh, experts and stakeholders under our umbrella. Uh, so this mission and the purpose, the vision, is uh, a clear message to the Sweden stakeholders what we do and want, what we want to achieve. And my message to all of you is work hard with this. Try to find your mission and vision and purpose and explain it for your stakeholders. Uh, it, have it as a message. Uh, repeat it again and again and again because new people come in this business, new generation, young professionals. Everybody needs to know what the National Committee or what the NEC doing in each and every country. Next one. We have a bit of history. I, I, this is more or less just for information. If you click on the 907, uh, sorry, if you just click Catherine there, you, you can go through this. We was established 907. You can click it down also, Catherine. Um, yeah. And uh, 1900, 1919, we, we established a national uh, mirror committee just working in, in the national area. Uh, so we had two organizations up to 1937 uh, when we merged them to become what we are today, the SEK, the Swedish Electrical Commission. Uh, 73, we come also became also responsible for the European standardization in Sweden, so to say, we became a member of Senelec. And 2000, it was a huge reorganization of the standardization made in Sweden. And we end up in three formal uh, standardization organization, which responds on global level to IEC, ISO, and ITU. And 2007, we uh, celebrate 100 year, and we also changed the name to more identify us what we do. We don't want to call us a commission. We, we start to call a Swedish ill standard. It's a name that uh, very clearly says what we are doing. Uh, if we go further on to the next slide, the national structure is uh, that we have three organizations responding to ITS, response to ITU, SEK, response to IEC, and CIS, response to ISO. In Sweden, we have formed a association between these three, three organizations. And uh, if you click once more, they only work towards the political establishment. The standardization association has nothing to do with technical issues. Technical issues is handled by each and every organization independently. The only thing the Standardization Association does is uh, speaking with one voice to the political est establishment, the government, the states, the authorities, the agencies, and so on. Um, the reason is that the polit political establishment has difficulties to separate 
different standardization organization. It's not so easy for them to understand the work scheme, uh, the differentiation in, in the different organization. That's the only reason why we have a common association in Sweden. Next picture. The relation between us uh, self is that uh, the three organization, we own this uh, standardization association. And uh, if you go further, one click more, all three standardization organization are private, we are independent, but very, very important. We collaborate with, with, with each other when we need on important topics, projects, and so on. So we have common working groups, we have common even technical committees, but we don't work through this association. That is only for the political engagement. That is very, very important to understand. Each and every standardization organization do the technical work for themselves, and if needed, we do it together. Next slide, please, Catherine. The structure in Sweden is, I must say, we have made it very easy for us. We have copied IEC structure, more or less. We have a council. We have a council board elected by the council. We have a letter technical board, corresponds to SMB. We have a certification board, corresponding to CAB. Uh, and of course, if you can, uh, we have all the technical committees. We have about 100 technical committees in Sweden active today, which is controlled or is as, uh, ruled by the Electrotechnical Board. And in the end, we have also an um, IEC office, but as we say in Sweden, the SAK office, which um, helps and coordinate the day-to-day -day work. Uh, thank you. Next slide. We go on. Uh, the council, the highest deci decision level, uh, they have the high level decision on, on member fees, budget, long term strategies, and things like that. They does not involve in the day to day work. That the council board do morally. They have the operative responsibility for the implementation of the finance and the strategies decided by the council. The council board uh, meets at least four times a year, usually six, uh, occasionally even more than that if, if it's a big question to be raised. And of course, the letter technical board corresponds to SMB and decides uh, on overall technical matters. They doesn't uh, go down in, in uh, technical questions that belongs to each and every technical committee. They only have the overall technical matters and, and responsibility. And in the end, we have also the certification boards that decides on all conformity assessment matters on high level. They does not go down to the schemes. Uh, for example, the IEC EE discussions, the IEC X, if it's not a matter of uh, an overall interest. That's the four decisions level we have in Sweden. And what is special about the council board is that um, it consists of nine members. That is not so special. Um, but uh, the next uh, 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 item is that it has six different categories that must be represented in this um, council board. And it's uh, the, it's a kind of stakeholder representation uh, for a broader participation. The first one is the producer of electrical or electrotechnical components, products, or equipment. Uh, the second uh, um, uh, category is uh, electrical energy producers. And we have also a third category is service providers. The fourth is the government agencies and authorities. We have the electrical installers at the fifth. And we have certification, testing, inspection, education, and NGOs at the sixth. And all of these categories must be represented in. So six person out of nine, or all nine, but six person 
has to be picked at least from one of these. So the board must consist of six members, at least. Of course, some can be doubled, coming two from one of these categories. This uh, enforces that we have a broad participation, a broad decision-making board. That's the reason and that's why we want to have these categories and classification of different stakeholders. This is, is in our statutes and it must be fulfilled to have a working uh, council board. Thank you. Next. The organization itself, we have 19 members that owns us more or less. We have eight people in the council board. Uh, we had 19 members in the letter technical board, nine person in the certification board. Uh, the council uh, approves the council board members and the council board approves the member of the electrotechnical board and the certification board. That's a bit different uh, compared to IEC. In IEC council uh, select the members of all these uh, uh, boards. Yeah, go on. Uh, we have about 1,200 experts total, uh, 400 out of them is more or less observers. They want to listen and be informed, but they don't participate actively. About four, uh, 700 people is active. They participate in our national work and of course on in the ISC and the European work as active experts. They take part and this take uh, uh, active part in the decision and the, the working with the standardization questions. And uh, if we go to the SEK office, we are 13 person employed here. Thank you. And this, you can just go on. This is more for information how, how, how it uh, is uh, built up and what is the production and so on. Uh, as I said, about 100 committees, number of standards and so on. This is more for information for you all. We can go further on. Then we have the participation. So <clears throat> first, we call it the business case. Um, that is more uh, towards the management of stakeholders, um, that we want to involve the people, the decisions makers, the people that uh, decides on uh, stakeholder representation and, and participation in the standardization. Uh, I don't say this is an easy task. This is very, very difficult to reach out to these type of people and to have them understand that standardization is a very important part of their work. Um, Usually these people more see to the economical benefits and we have learned the hard way that you need to talk to these people about the economical benefits about standardization. It's really difficult to come to them and say that this technical uh, thing or this technical uh, advancement uh, is uh, important or uh, has benefits for your company. They don't listen to such things. They want to know, know what is the most or best economical benefits, why do we participate uh, on, on economical basis. So that's the way we usually promote standardization towards the management. Benefits on economical and strategic, strategic issues. Next one. Uh, to do this, we have found out that uh, participation in fairs and exhibition, high level, on uh, the management level, is a very good way to, to reach these uh, persons, because usually they are very, very occupied, they are very difficult to reach, but in fairs and exhibition, they come and they are more relaxed and they want to see what what the future will bring in for their company or, or business and usually we can reach them in a much better way in the fairs and the exhibition. 
in a more relaxed way to get them around the table and talk to them. So that is a it is a tip for, for you if you have that possibility. We usually try to arrange breakfast meetings. I don't say it's a success, but uh, sometimes it shows up uh, people that we want to reach, uh, usually on these hot topics that are very important uh, for the moment, so, so to say, uh, change in, in business culture and things like that. Uh, it's a way, but not the best way, maybe. And of course, we use uh, social media, emails, net uh, newsletters, and things like that. Uh, that's more of a standardization way to f try to reach uh, people and, and to reach the management. And maybe the best way is try to engage the experts that you have in the standardization technical work to be the ambassador for you to talk inside their own companies to spread information about the standardization and the good what the standardization can do for the company. This uh, engagement of experts, uh, on the other hand, needs that they are educated in what and how they should talk to the management and their bosses uh, to be a good ambassador, because just talking is not good. You should say the right words. Usually, as I said, they listen on economical terms. And I will, in the end of the presentation, go come back to this about, um, we have some courses and things about this. So the next slide, please. Then we come down to the expert that really do the work. Um, and we try always to do a promotion to all experts in Sweden that they should partic participate in, of course, the uh, national committees, but through us, through ESECO, be a, be a participator in the IEC work because it's where it happens, where you can really and strongly affect the work and be a part of it. We always try to find experts, bo both old and new technical uh, young professionals. Um, it's a huge work, it's not so easy. It uh, requires a lot of uh, effort, energy and time. Um, but we try to do it in many, many different ways. But one way of do it and one way to get the stakeholders on the decision level more interested is that we have what we call a travel grant for head of delegation. They get a uh, little money to represent Sweden on plenary, plenary, plenary meetings. And we have also travel grants for chase, secretary, conveners, and project, project leaders in IEC work. That is uh, a reason, a reason to that is to engage people more and take this kind of work uh, and, and uh, to perform it. It's not so easy to find people doing this. It's a huge work usually, and um, you, you, it takes time. So just to give them a little, uh, so to say, motivation, we have these travel grants. So they get paid to do a bit of the work. No, I don't say all, it's, it's a small grant, but it shows that we have a positive, uh, way of seeing on these type of works and it usually also helps them to motivate for their bosses or people inside uh, their own company to, to take on such kind of work. Uh, we have also direct part, uh, sorry, uh, we don't take any fees for international participation if you're a member of our committees. Uh, the member fee for being a member of a SEK committee is about four to eight hundred euro and annually. But if you go to the next one, we have for direct participation. If you don't want to be a member of the SEK national committee, you can register through us 
through SAK, of course, by direct into the IEC work. If you want to be a member of a working group, a maintenance team, a project team, or, or whatever. And we take out a, a, a fee, uh, 200 euro, for each participation in such working group. And um, that has uh, been used uh, very, very, uh, or it, the number of experts have increased uh, quite drastically the last four or five years for this direct participation. It's very much appreciated by our stakeholders. Uh, and we have also uh, representatives for some of our stakeholders that we don't take out any fee for is a non-profit environmental and consumer organization and people that are hired at college and universities, teachers and professors and so on. They participate without charge in, in standardization in SAK. So, then we go to the committees. Uh, we have some rules in Sweden. We want each and every technical committee to have at least one meeting per year, face to face, or you can or you can can participate per distance. But uh, we try to get them together. Uh, it's um, we usually think it's very fruitful to have face to face meeting to learn to know each other and to di discuss um, problems over some coffee, lunches and so on. We have seen that that is truly more fruitful than only have distance meetings. Uh, to make the work easy for our, our experts, uh, we have granted the access for them to have copies of all standards. They are used for, of course, personal use. They are watermarked uh, with an address and name. And uh, they have access to all standards in their responsibility areas. Usually it is a mirroring of the ISC committees. Sometimes we have one or two committees. Uh, sometimes we have uh, three or four committees, uh, which one Swedish committee is responsible for. It depends on the area and the interest of work in, from the stakeholders in Sweden. And at each and every meeting, we try to encourage them to see on new work items, to find out what will be the future, what will be the new technologies, are there any items that are not covered in ISC? We try to encourage new work items. It's not easy, it takes a lot of time and effort, and uh, we want strongly that to be increased in Sweden. And uh, usually we talk a lot about um, horizontal aspects and horizontal activities. And, in the last five years, to encourage such activities, we have invited to the SAK office two or more committees in nearby technical areas to come and to um, exchange information, give presentation to each other, to highlight common issues or to get discussion that are fruitful for more than one committee, so to say. We think that more people involved in problems and challenges, the better res, uh, results we get in the end. This has been very welcomed by, by many experts that they know the world outside their own committee. So we will for sure continue these activities in the future. Yeah, we go on. One thing that we have uh, seen in our committee work is that it's difficult to have a lot of people involved in the communication to the SAK office when we're talking about, for example, voting or uh, making comments to documents. What we have in 
in Sweden we have one designated person that uh, controls and do all the communication with the SEK office. He or she communicate all information about voting, about comments, um, information or whatever and vice versa, SEK office can contact these those persons in all kind of matters that are connected to this technical committee and it's his or her responsibility to spread information within the committee. And as a gratification, this contact person for the work he does is uh, don't have to pay any member fee. It's a small kind of gratification, but it works. Um, most of the contact person are happy with this kind of um, work uh, and the small payment they got for it. Uh, yeah, and we have also a, a rule that uh, says that all votings and comments must be di distributed in the beginning of the work. Uh, in the beginning of the week when we have the deadline for, for that uh, comment or voting for the document. It works quite good, not always in the best way. If we not have any information we try to remember them and um, uh, the next day and uh, if you go to the next line. Uh, if we have no answer the day before Friday, which usually is the deadline, uh, at least in Sweden and IEC, we usually vote uh, no uh, abstention or we just say that we don't have any comments for some documents that uh, is for comment. And now I come back to education. As I said, it's important to educate our experts to be good members and to be the voice of the standardization. So we have one basic course, it's for more or less newcomers, uh, where we inform in a very broad aspect about standardization. We have that in two times, in, in uh, the spring and in the autumn. After that we have an advanced course, that means that uh, people that attend this course has been involved in the standardization for a number of years at least. Uh, they know how uh, uh, the standardization works and uh, they usually have a lot of questions after a while. And uh, this course we have usually one or two times, we, we have it one, at least one times a year. Uh, usually two times and that is also in the spring and in the autumn. And then we have a third course, uh, we call it expert course. Uh, it's for people with very long experience in, in the IEC work and usually they also have uh, worked as a convener, project leader, they can even be a chairman or secretary and um, the, these uh, courses are in very deep uh, uh, standardization work. We, we go deep into the directives, uh, we, we talk about uh, joint work with ISO and things like that and this course we usually have only once a year. And uh, in the end we have also special courses for our chairs and secretary of IEC committees and this is uh, on demand so to say. This forms uh, the, the overall education in, in uh, SEK. And at last I can just show you some financing. Um, the revenues last year, uh, sales and royalties, we, um, it's more than 50%. We have member fees, it's a quarter of the revenues. We have some governmental grants, about 10 percentage. This is just for information. And then of course if we have revenues we usually have costs and Sadly we have, and uh, I think this is my last slide. Uh, of course we, we are an expert organization, so the personal employed at the SEK is uh, high educated, so the most of the cost is personal. We have some premises and, and marketing, it's, it's the usual for, for uh, organization or business. So, uh, I think that was more or less the last slide. I also want as, uh, as a last uh, 
thing say that Sweden are involved in the affiliate uh, mentoring program and Sweden have a mentoring program with Bhutan and uh, for those who listen uh, it doesn't matter if you're on the affiliate side or the member side uh, I want to encourage if you have the possibility to be engaged in this kind of mentorship program it gives a lot of good uh, both for the mentor and for the mentoring we have a very good exchange with Beton and we learn a lot uh, Sweden have 110 years of history in standardization um, but to be honest the future lies in the new countries and we need to understand them and we need also the help from them to understand what they need so if you have the possibility I encourage you to go into the affiliate mentoring program and if you have any questions about that I'm really happy to answer them that concludes my presentation thank you for listening thank you very much uh, Thomas so now the floor is open to the participants if you have a question or a comment you can either use the chat function or click on the hand raising button which you will find in the control panel on the left. So we already have uh, one question from Mr. Masmoudi who is the NC Secretary of Tunisia and that's for Catherine. Uh, so the question is uh, how to, what are your suggestions uh, to deal uh, with the lack of involvement of stakeholders? Can you unmute yourself Catherine? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's that's an excellent question, and I think it, the the answer is unfortunately uh, not a simple one for me. So you've given me a, a tough challenge here. Um, my experience is uh, the most effective way of convincing uh, companies and organisations to send their experts to participate in your national committee is by having other companies and, and organizations that are already participating uh, go and talk to those companies and organizations that you want to bring in. Um, this can be done in many different ways. Uh, there can be, for example, a one-on-one -on -one visit to the company. Perhaps uh, the NC can go with a couple of executives from a company who is already participating or you can have a workshop a forum for a group of uh, companies or um, organizations in your country where you have some speakers who are from companies that are benefiting from already participating because uh, the message from those that are benefiting that in some cases are the competitors uh, are really the ones that will convince the companies and organizations to get involved Personally, I, I believe, based on the discussions I've had with the national committees, that that is the most effective mechanism. But there are many, many more, as mentioned on some of my slides and as Thomas has explained himself. So the best thing to do is to have uh, individual discussion for your particular case. So perhaps we can do that after this webinar. Okay, thank you. So we have uh, uh, a question from Mr. Hemraj. Uh, who would like to know the level of membership and the benefits of the levels. So I think, Catherine, that's more for you. Okay, so we have two different types of membership, and then we have uh, the Affiliate Country Programme, which is uh, for non-members but uh, developing countries. Um, so the membership forms are full membership and associate membership, and full members uh, have the rights to participate in IEC work at all levels. They can participate in all the technical committees, all the conformity assessment systems, and they can participate in all of the uh, governance uh, management decisions. So they are a member of council and they can nominate and elect the uh, members of the boards. Associate members have um, the right to participate in up to four technical committees uh, that means they can comment and vote on the documents and uh, they can comment on the documents of all the other technical committees 
uh, but without voting rights. They cannot participate in the uh, management of the IEC as they are not members of council. So associate membership is a limited form of participation for countries with limited means. Not all countries can be associate members. That's based on a calculation of uh, GNI and electricity consumption per capacitor to determine whether or not a country can become associate or has to become a full member. The other thing that all members have the rights to is to receive all IEC publications for adoption and commercial exploitation purposes. So that's full and associate members have the same rights for that. In the affiliate country program, it's uh, as I explained, it's not a, a form of membership, but it's a, a program that is aimed at helping developing countries who are not yet in a situation to participate in IEC's work. And um, we, we provide them with a, a number of standards. It can be 200 or 400, depending on the situation, uh, for free. So they can start setting up a national library, and they can adopt those standards um, as national standards. OK. Thank you, Catherine. So uh, I think we will take a uh, last question now that we are running out of time. Uh, there's a question from Ed Timofichuk, uh, who would uh, like to know if there are measures of real success in talking to management people in companies. So maybe for Thomas. Uh, um, yes, we have seen, I, I can't say a great success, but an improvement in success we have seen when we're talking about the new areas that are coming up. And with the new areas we're talking about smart cities, we're talking about uh, smart uh, energy or smart grid, we're talking about uh, AAL, uh, uh, for example, uh, these type of sectorizing, uh, these type of broad areas are more interested to the management instead of these or those really technical questions that we usually arises. So there we see a, a quite big improvement. And of course, all those areas are connected to some kind of business of economical purpose in the end. We have learned that you must talk about benefits in economical terms when you talk about with the management. It's more or less hopeless to talk pure technical details. I, I would uh, strongly suggest try to avoid that when you talk about ma with the management. New areas, business for the future, strategies, and economical benefits. That's the uh, medicine, I think. Thank you. OK. Thank you, Thomas. So I think we will end our webinar now. There are a few questions more, but we will uh, reply to you uh, directly. Uh, so thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Thomas, for your contribution to our session today. Uh, do you have a final word before we end our session? Um, uh, Thomas? Yeah, thank you. I, I just want to thank you all listeners and uh, also IEC for arranging this uh, type of webinar. I think it's quite fruitful uh, and uh, to reach out. I, I'm, I'm happy to uh, be a participator. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Catherine? Um, I just uh, would like to say that I think one of the core things to bear in mind is that the main benefit from being a member of IEC is really that, that you can get involved in IEC work. So when you um, want to advance your national committee, the most important thing is to prepare a plan of participation and that's the way that your country stakeholders are really going to benefit from IEC membership. OK, thank you very much. So thank you, everybody, for your participation. For your information, the webinar has been recorded, and we will share the link as well as the presentation with all the participants. 
So thank you again and goodbye. Thank you. Bye.